Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 127, The Art and Culture of the Hanse. Now, our history of the Hanse has come to an end. Not with a bang, but with a whimper. Of the things that have remained, we've already talked a lot. The ideal of an honorable Hanseatic merchant, the cultural and the political links to Scandinavia, and the stories. The stories of the famous pirates, Klaus Störtebecker and Hans Benecke, the heroics of the wars fought with Denmark, and the antics of Jürgen Wollenweber. But there is something that reminds us of the days when traders speaking Low German fed Europe fish, beer and grain. And that are the cultural achievements, the town halls, the weighing houses and stores that became the symbols of civic pride, the artists whose work adorned churches and palaces across the Baltic Sea, and last but not least, the brick churches that shaped the way these cities still appear. So, let's have a look. Now, and since podcasting is one of the most unsuitable mediums to talk about visual art, I have added a few images to the episode webpage, which you can find at historyofthegermans.com slash 127-2. But before we start, it is my privilege to thank all the patrons who have signed up on patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or on my website, historyofthegermans.com. Your help is much, much appreciated. And for those of you who are still on the sidelines, come on and join. You can become a knight of the realm for the price of a cappuccino per month, equally stimulating, less calorific and much more prestigious. And here are the names of the four amongst your number who've already taken the plunge. John C., Ole S., Louis-Philippe M., and Edward B. Thanks, you guys, very much. Now, back to the show. The Hanse ended officially in 1669 with the last Hanseatic diet. But for centuries afterwards, the cities of Hamburg, Lübeck, and Bremen were the caretakers of the remaining tangible possessions of the institution, specifically the contour buildings in London, Bruges and Antwerp. The three cities would also maintain joint embassies and consulates abroad, and after the unification of Germany in 1871, they maintained a Hanseatic representation in Berlin that lasted until 1933. Thanks not only to this cooperation, but multiple other factors, the three cities weren't integrated into territorial states until the 20th century, when Lübeck became part of Schleswig-Holstein. Hamburg and Bremen are still city-states with their own state governments and a seat in the Bundesrat, something none of the other great free imperial cities, Frankfurt, Nuremberg, Augsburg and Cologne, to name just a few, did achieve. So in a way, one of the legacies of the Hanse is the existence of the city-states of Hamburg and Bremen. But beyond the political, what is left today? Let's start with language. One of the defining factors and some of the glue that kept the Hanse network together was the common language spoken by merchants from Novgorod to Bergen, Low German. And as you may have noticed by now, I am no linguist, and every time I comment on this topic, I find myself in hot water. So I will not go into the detailed analysis of Low Middle German, Low Saxon and Low Franconian. There are clear differences between these languages, but one important point is that they could understand each other easily much more easily than they could understand people living south of a line from Cologne to Frankfurt under Oder, who spoke a version of High German. Whether this linguistic gap was a function or a cause of the great rift between the emperors and the Saxons that dominated the 11th to the 13th century, well, I'm not qualified to comment on. Now, Low German was not only the language of the common people, but also the language of business and law. Since most of the Hanse cities on the Baltic had adopted the law of the city of Lübeck, the court cases were held in the dialect of that city. Likewise, the cities who had adopted Magdeburg law often adopted that dialect for their legal procedures. In the 14th century, Low German, in particular the version spoken in Lübeck, replaced Latin, not only in the local courts, but also as the language of diplomacy and politics. The records of the Hanseatic diets had originally been kept in Latin. But from 1369 onwards, i.e. from the time of the victory of the Danish king Waldemar Atterdag, the Hanse kept their records in Low German. Not only that, the Hanse was in such a powerful position it could insist on the use of Low German even in correspondence with the Scandinavian rulers and the Flemish cities. This transition to the common tongue instead of Latin happened somewhat earlier in the Hanse, 
than, for instance, in France, where François Premier declared French the official language only in 1539. Why that is? We can only speculate. One reason may be that many city officials who had spent their life trading simply never learned enough Latin. Equally, some of the smaller Hansa cities could not or did not want to pay for a scribe proficient in Latin. And finally, the church and its Latin-speaking clergy played a much smaller role in the world these men and women inhabited than they did in the rest of Europe. Low German may have become the language of business, law and politics, but it did not gain much traction as a literary language. Most of the literature of the time, like the mini leader and the chivalric romances, were written and read in Middle High German. The one literary work that gained national significance was Reinecke Fuchs, the story of the wily fox who escapes from an ever-mounting pile of evidence of his wrongdoings by framing his arch-enemy, Isegrim the wolf. Now, the story of the clever fox is just one iteration of a well-known tale that goes back to Aesop and the Roman de Renard in the 13th century and continued until today with the fantastic Mr. Fox. But Reinecke Fuchs was the most successful version in the German lands and after the translation into High German was even picked up much later by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Really, great literature from the Hansa city came in the 20th century. And to name just the giants, there is the Mann family, Thomas, Heinrich, Erika, Klaus and Golo, probably the most gifted literary family in the German language. Günther Grass, you already met, and there's Wolfgang Borchert, another one of my favorites. So I could go on, but they all wrote in High German. Though the belletristic literature wasn't exactly the late medieval Hansard's cup of beer, history was. From very early on, the cities or the patrician societies sponsored writers to record the past of their cities, which is why we have a fairly uninterrupted record of historic events all throughout the Middle Ages. The use of Low German in commercial and political communications declined almost exactly in line with the decline in the influence of the Hanse. In part, that was due to the Lutheran Church that emphasized Luther's translation of the Bible into High German and from 1530 onwards published all church documentation in High German. At the same time, the southern German traders like the Fugger took an ever larger role as counterparts to the Hanse merchants and they insisted on High German. The reform of the imperial administration and legal system by Maximilian I and Charles V shifted the legal language to High German. And finally, the Renaissance led to a revival in the use of Latin. So, by 1631, even Lübeck itself had changed the language of its announcements to the general population from Low German to High German. Low German became the language of the lower classes, whilst the patricians and the university-educated professionals spoke High German. The same process took place in the Hanse cities along the Baltic coast, in Gdansk, in Riga and in Tallinn. Since the late 19th century, efforts had been made to rehabilitate Low German. Authors write in the language and one of Hamburg's largest park was called Planten on Blumen, a forthright description so characteristic for northern Germany. Now today, Low German or Plattdeutsch is recognized as a regional language, not just as a dialect and submissions in Low German have to be accepted by courts and authorities. Now, a rather unexpected element of the Hanseatic culture was a love for chivalric romances and their heroes. As we mentioned before a couple of times, the patricians, despite most of them being in trade, saw themselves the equals of the knights and lower aristocracy. They did engage in aristocratic pastimes like hunts and tournaments. Moreover, they did get very fond of the nine great heroes or nine worthies. This is a rather motley crew, comprising three heroes of antiquity, Hector, Alexander and Julius Caesar, three chivalric heroes of the Old Testament, Joshua, David and Judas Maccabeus, and finally three Christian heroes, King Arthur, Charlemagne and Godfrey of Bouillon. Nobody can explain what drove this choice, but we find them most beautifully depicted in the Hansa Hall of the Rathaus of Cologne, and the beautiful fountain in Nuremberg. Now one of these heroes, King Arthur, seemed to have struck a particular chord with the citizens of Prussia. The cities of Danzig, Elbing, Riga and Stralsund all had Arthur's courts, 
where the patricians meant and pretended that they were knights of the round table. Chivalric heroes were also pressed into service as defenders of citizens' freedoms. Reinald of Montauban, one of the four sons of Count Aymond, became the patron saint and defender of Dortmund, while statues of the mighty Roland proliferated from Bremen across the Hansa world. Painting and sculpture is something that rarely comes to mind when talking about the Hanse. Many great museums in Germany are today in the cities that had once been the capitals of powerful princes with huge budgets for representation, rather than in places dominated by sober and penny-pinching merchants. Berlin, Munich, Dresden inherited and then expanded these princely collections. And others like Cologne and Nuremberg had been made centers for the great national collections in archaeology and art. But Hamburg, Bremen and Lübeck do not often feature on the bucket list of art lovers. A bit unfairly, I have to say, since, for instance, the Kunsthalle in Hamburg houses very interesting exhibitions. But all that does not mean that there weren't some astounding artists active during the heyday of the Hanse. Like everywhere in Europe, the congregations of the Hanse cities did their utmost to fill their churches with great pieces of art. Wooden sculptures and monumental altarpieces were their preferred donations. There are a few names of artists we know, like Bertram of Minden and Master Franke from Hamburg. If you want to see works by the latter, there are some in Hamburg, but the largest, most complete work is in the Finnish National Museum. It got there because it was in a small church in a place called Kalanti, today part of a modern town of 14,000 people that I simply cannot pronounce. I tried. I can't. Seemingly, Kalanti was a large enough trading post in the 14th century to order a large piece of art from a Hamburg master. But the greatest of these Hansa artists was probably Bernd Notke, 1440-1509. He had travelled extensively, had learned his craft in the Netherlands and in Italy, where he got heavily influenced by Mantegna. He set up shop in Lübeck, but stayed in Sweden for 15 years, where he became master of the Royal Mint, before he returned back to Lübeck. His works can be found in many Hanse cities, including in the Church of St. Mary in Lübeck. But again, if you want to see his masterpieces, you need to take a ship or plane. Though he was a Renaissance artist, he remained in many ways wedded to medieval themes and imagery. That medieval sensibility is most apparent in the Totentanz, or Danse Macabre. A Totentanz is a motif that had emerged after the Black Death, and it shows the whole of society, from the emperor down to the lowly peasant, dancing with grinning skeletons, reminding the viewer that the world enjoys of beauty, health and wealth are temporary, and that the grim reaper is waiting for us all. Exceedingly cheerful, I know. But Notke manages to depict the skeletons with so much verve and joy one is almost compelled to join them in their pogo. There used to be two versions, a short one with 13 figures in Tallinn and a 30 meter long and 1.9 meter high frieze in the Marienkirche in Lübeck. Now the Lübeck version had already deteriorated badly in 1701 and was replaced with a faithful copy. That was still very much admired. In 1942 the authorities had a wooden cover built to protect the image against bomb damage. The Royal Air Force attack on Lübeck was the very first of the World War II bombing raids, and the city was ill-prepared. In particular, the use of firebombs was unexpected. And as the firestorm raged through the Marienkirche, the wooden cover caught fire, and the dance macabre came to its long-prophesied end. Now fortunately, the copy in Tallinn survived, and Notke's greatest work also survived World War II. And it is also not in Germany. It is the altar of St. George in the church of St. Nikolai in Stockholm, the Stockkirren. Oh, please forgive my Swedish. I have only seen pictures of it, and if I ever get a chance to go to Stockholm, this is the number one on the list. It was commissioned by the Swedish regent Sten Sture, who had made a solemn promise to honor St. George before he went into the Battle of Brunkeberg. Now, that was the battle that threw out King Christian I of Denmark and led to the collapse of the Kalmar Union. Episode 1, 2, 3, if you want to refresh your memory. The Battle of Brunkeberg was a hugely important event, but, hey, did not go do it justice. Depictions of St. George are one a penny in European art, but I have not seen one before where St. George is sculpted in wood and including horse and plinth is 20 feet tall. 
his sword raised, his horse rearing up in fear before the dragon. And what a dragon it is. Not one of those cute little salamanders you normally see cowering at the feet of the saint, ready to be pierced by some dainty lance. No, this is a real dragon, a terrifying monster whose gargantuan mouth could easily swallow a horse's head in one gulp. And the animal has captured the lance, and only a well-placed hit with a sword raised high can save St. George and the damsel in distress who is praying nearby. This was made at the same time as the much more famous early equestrian statues of Bartolomeo Colleoni in Venice and Gatta Malata in Padua. But, as Wilhelm Pinder said, it stands up to them as their Nordic counterpoint. As amazing as the St. George is, or seems to be given I've never seen it in the flash, painting and sculpture aren't the most important legacies of the Hanse. When we think of their great artistic achievements, we think of the humble brick and what could be created with it. Now, before we go into the whole topic of brick gothic, let us not forget that the Hanse comprised more than the towns on the Baltic and the North Sea. The inland cities of the Hanse, Cologne, Dortmund, Münster, Soest, Braunschweig and all these others, did not build in brick, but in stone. And boy, did they create some amazing things. The city of Cologne is proud of its history as a free city and conveyed that pride in its town hall and the Gürzenich, a sort of party house with the largest dance floor in the empire. And since the citizens of Cologne are a sensible bunch, they also put a market hall in the ground floor. Münster too has an incredibly impressive Rathaus, dating back in part to the 13th century, and is famous as the place where the Peace of Westphalia was negotiated. Dortmund has one of the oldest town halls amongst the stone-built cities, and Brunswick one of the most beautiful. Now, the city is in what the art historians call the Hausteinzone, or the quarried stone area, differed not just in terms of material from the brick-built cities from Riga to Bremen. The inland cities were older than the Hanse cities east of the Elbe River. Not all have roots as deep as Cologne, but Brunswick, Münster, Soest and Dortmund date back to the conquest of Saxony and featured Romanesque cathedrals and palaces that had already shaped their structure when the Hanse got going. The cities in the brick zone, with the exception of Bremen, did not have much, if any, stone buildings in the 12th century. Some were entirely new settlements like Riga or Tallinn, or they grew up alongside Slavic settlements like in Danzig or Stettin. That left the merchant elite with carte blanche to build cities that reflected their idea of beauty and functionality. And by coincidence, just as they got going, a new architectural style was created back at the Abbaye de Saint-Denis in France, the Gothic style. And what added to the consistency of the Hanse cities was that they stuck with the Gothic style largely into the 16th century, after which many of these places declined in wealth and importance, which precluded major rebuilding projects. The Hanse cities were often planned as rectangles with the market square in the middle, and that market square was to be fronted by a town hall, offering a place to trade, to meet your fellow citizens and to engage in politics. Most often, the actual city hall was built on the first floor above the cloth hall, whilst the cellar held the wine store. And the Rathaus in Lübeck became the blueprint for many other brick-built town halls. It initially consisted of two separate, comparatively modest buildings. One was the cloth hall and the other a place for social and political gatherings. Now, these two buildings were then connected and given a new joint facade. In the 14th century, a new wing was added on the eastern side of the market square and then in the 15th century, a further extension was built. All of that was built in brick. Now, one important thing to know about brick is it's a terrible material if you set your heart on decorating your brand new town hall with statues, capitals and gargoyles. Brick just cannot do that. But still, they did want some decoration and came up with a unique way to impress the importance and wealth of their city upon its visitors. They created these monumental facades before the actual buildings that also reached well above the level of the roofline behind, serving no other purpose than decoration. The architects designed large round or pointed gothic openings that they then decorated with quatrefoils, rosettes and more intricate designs they added finely chiselled gables and columns to add even more decoration. 
so Stralsund is probably the most successful of these designs. Now beyond the town hall, we find similar features on other public buildings, like the weighing houses, the exchanges and city stores for salt and grain, etc. And then the city's merchant and artisans would compete to have the most impressive guild hall in the best spot on the market square. But overlooking all of these were the churches. And that is another way in which the Hanse in the north differs from the inland cities. With the exception of Bremen, there is no mighty cathedral that exceeds all other churches in size and splendor of decoration. Even in the cities that had their own bishop, like Lübeck, Riga or Tallinn, it was the parish church, funded by the merchants, that was the largest, the most sumptuously decorated and the one featuring the tallest tower. Now, the Hansards had a thing about having very tall towers. 125 meters seems to have been the standard to beat, which keeps Lübeck, Riga and Tallinn in the top 20 of the highest church towers in the world to this day, all of them taller than Salisbury Cathedral. And allegedly, St. Mary in Stralsund was even 151 meters high, which would have made it the highest building in the world until it was hit by lightning in 1549. These towers had a specific Hansa-related purpose. They could be seen from miles out at sea or downriver, and as sailors returned from long journeys, they were cheered by this first glimpse of their hometown. Brick architecture remained a key identifier of Hansa architecture, even though many masterpieces of brick gothic, like Corinne Monastery or the Teutonic Knights Castle in Malbrook, had little or no connection to the Hanse. When Hamburg reconnected culturally and architecturally with its Hanse roots, they chose visible brick to build the Speicherstadt and then in the 1920s developed an architectural style called brick expressionism that gave us the Chile House that rises like a curved red ocean liner out of the mass of houses near the Elbe. It was this reconnecting to the Hanseatic traditions in the 1880s that did not only materialize in the architecture of Hamburg. When Georg Sartorius sat down in 1802 to write the very first modern history of the Hanse, he did so because he sought refuge from the upheavals of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, believing that nothing could be further from contemporary politics than this half-forgotten antiquity. But he was quite thoroughly wrong. As a faithful listener to the history of the Germans, you know that right around this time, historians and pseudo-historians began combing through Europe's past in the hope to find some German hero stories that could be woven into a new national narrative. And what could be better than a story of a maritime empire that once controlled the Baltic Sea, that beat the kings of Denmark and England in war, and that left behind magnificent romantic cities? Quickly the Hanse, that famously had no organization, no army, and crucially no desire to go to war when it could be avoided, was painted as an expansionist united maritime power that rivaled the English and French and was only prevented from conquering the New World by the lack of a strong German state. Now, I initially wanted to go into this in a lot more detail, but as it happened, I may have secured an interview with a person who's literally written a book about the perception of the Huns in the 19th, 20th and now the 21st century. So, I do not want to forerun this interview, which may come out in mid-December. And that gets me also to the plan for the new season, the Teutonic Nights. I will probably need the usual two to three weeks of preparation for that. And that might mean no episodes until the end of November, except for maybe some short pieces on little gems I have come across along the way. And just to keep you guys excited about coming back, let me tell you that what comes after the Teutonic Nights. We will get back to the chronological narrative. We will resume the story of the Holy Roman Empire where we left off at the death of Conradin. We will wade through the blood-soaked decades of the Interregnum that brings one Rudolf of Habsburg to the throne, just in time for him to gain his family, the Duchy of Austria, with well-known consequences. And before the Habsburgers get to settle on the imperial throne for good, history has granted us the Luxembourgers, Henry VII, Charles IV, Wenzel the Lazy and Sigismund. Fascinating figures who shaped Europe from their capital in Prague. I hope you will come along for the journey.